I'm Liam Kelly from the Institute of Asian Studies at University Brunei Jerusalem, and I'm here today with Assistant Professor Merlin Franco, the Deputy Director of the Institute of Asian Studies, and we are going to talk today about hornbills. Uh, thanks, Merlin, for sitting down and having this talk. Um, it's an exciting moment because you have a new article coming out. It's entitled, When the Seeds Sprout, the Hornbills Hatch, uh, Understanding the Traditional Ecological Knowledge of the Ibans of Brunei Jerusalem. And it's coming out in the Journal of Ethnobiology and Ethnomedicine. And it's uh, the result of some research that you did in the Temburong district of Brunei on the traditional ecological knowledge of Iban or the Iban people about hornbills, correct? That's right. Okay, so maybe a good place to start for people who aren't familiar with this is just a little bit what are hornbills and why are they so important for Borneo and Brunei? Thanks, Ria. Mm -hmm. um, before we start, thank you so much for welcoming me okay. to this beautiful studio of yours. And it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, hornbills, um, they play an important role in the ecosystem, mm -hmm. especially in rainforest ecosystem. Mm -hmm. They're quite charismatic. That's why people are fascinated by, the, uh, by them. Uh -huh. uh, there are around uh, 59 species of hornbills, mostly in Africa and Asia. Uh -huh. And uh, they play an important role in the ecology in terms of um, dispersing seeds. Mm. So, for instance, if you take Borneo, mm. you could say that uh, the regeneration capacity of a deforested or a degraded forest would largely depend on how much seed dispersers are available. Mm. Um, uh, for instance, hornbills, gibbons, or any other animals that are capable of uh, uh, dispersing seeds from remaining forests mm. to these uh, uh, degraded patches. Mm. And hornbills are known to play an important role there. Okay. That's why uh, some researchers prefer to call them as farmers of the forest. Ah, uh, okay, right. Yeah, because they farm. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, but that's a kind of modern um, view of things. Traditionally, they're very important for people like the Iban as well, yeah. is that right? And what, I mean, is that's more of a, uh, based on their, what they look like, their symbolism or something, or? Yeah, well, that's the beauty of hornbills. On one side, we have this ecological importance. Right. On the other side, we have the cultural importance. Right. So they are important to almost all the native communities in Borneo. Mm. Uh, the difference uh, or the, uh, the ways in which all these communities appreciate uh, hornbills would depend on the circumstances or depend upon okay. the community. Yeah. But they all have some kind right. of importance attached to hornbills. Yeah. For the Iban people with whom we collaborated, for the Ibans of Brunei especially, uh, they attach cultural importance to hornbills, but um, we couldn't figure out exactly what kind of cultural importance it is. Uh, throughout uh, Borneo, the, wherever Iban people are there, they have celebrated mm. uh, hornbills. Um, um, for, if you look into birds in Iban mythology, the birds that are celebrated most are the seven woman birds. Um, and then uh, the Brahmini kite or the oh. white-headed kite. Oh, okay. Uh, we don't see hornbills there. Ah, okay, interesting, okay. Yeah. But what we see is that hornbills are, uh, play an important role in their um, songs, in their dances, in oh, okay. their war dances especially. Uh, it's, a, it's a bit of mystery how they got elevated to that status. I see. Uh, maybe because of their um, uh, charisma, mm. Uh, or maybe people had observed their importance in uh, in the local ecosystem. And we should also remember that hornbills occupy one of the top position in the food chain in the forest. Mm -hmm. in, in what way? In, in, uh, because they uh, they mo mostly dwell on the canopy and above, I on see. the emergent layer. So for people uh, who, who tend to observe uh, this phenomenon, uh, right. the natural phenomenon, then 
uh, it's quite natural that uh, they uh, they are accorded a high star I status, see. Right, yeah, right, which yeah. is corresponding to that of the ecology. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, so anyway, I think in your article you mentioned that you know the, all this stuff about the cultural aspects has been written about by others, and and you want to focus on the traditional ecological knowledge That's of the right. Iban That's regarding right. the, the hornbill. So, um, I, you know, I've, I've heard of indigenous knowledge and things like that. What exactly is traditional ecological knowledge? Yeah, um, we understand that all there are so many definitions. We have indigenous knowledge, as you said, you have local knowledge, you have local ecological knowledge, you have mm -hmm. traditional knowledge, you have traditional ecological right. knowledge. But uh, personally, we don't subscribe, or we, or we would say that uh, we don't subscribe to a particular school of thought. Mm -hmm. uh, we just uh, chose traditional ecological knowledge because it was more suitable to our conditions, to the study location. So we see traditional ecological knowledge as a set of knowledge on the environment okay. the, uh, that, is, that has been accumulated by a community over a period of time and has been transmitted from one generation to another. Mm -hmm. But specifically, um, for a, to, uh, because it's a scientific study, we have to adopt a particular definition. Right. And we did adopt the, this beautiful definition given by Asha. Okay. That's uh, traditional ecological knowledge refers to all types of knowledge about the environment derived from the experience and traditions of a particular group of people. Okay, okay. Um, okay, so you're, you went to Tamborong to try to um, figure out what is this traditional ecological knowledge of Iban, right? Could you tell us what did you find out? Uh, does it exist? Who possesses it? And, and uh, what did you learn? Um, maybe I should give a bit of an introduction about how this project sure, was born. Uh -huh. So when I was in Temperong for a different reason, mm -hmm. and I was talking to the local people there, and I was curious about hornbills and the local knowledge on hornbills, and I was talking to Iban people, and some of them said that, oh no, we have lost mm -hmm. much of it. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, uh, that was a bit of, uh, I, I was a bit skeptical about that, mm -hmm. because the more I uh, talked to people, I could understand that there, that is definitely something. It's just that the people don't realize that mm -hmm. it reminds that. Right. So this project was born out of the curiosity. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. So it was more like a challenge right. to show that no, we haven't lost it. Uh, yeah. um, what made you skeptical of that, just out of curiosity? So I think most people would assume that with development and you know contact yeah. with cities, it would disappear. You know, Brunei is known to be an oil-based economy. Right. Uh, so people would assume that people have given up everything and have uh, right. embraced this uh, mm -hmm. oil-based economy and the benefits yeah. that bring out of it. Yeah, that's true. Uh -huh. It's true, but they haven't given up much of their traditional knowledge. I see, okay. So even prominent members who constantly work with communities in related area. Right. We particularly contacted a tour guide who, uh, who was a Iban, uh, Iban by herself or himself. Uh -huh. And uh, that person said that, uh, no, there's no point in doing research oh, okay. with uh, Temporong, no point in collaborating with the Iban people here. Okay because our people has, have lost everything. Okay, well, so, but you found it, so how did this happen? Uh, that was a Eureka moment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, I was lucky to have collaborated with uh, Mingu, who is my co-researcher, and right. she's from uh -huh. the urban community okay. herself. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, she did a purposely sampling. Mm. So she went around talking to people, uh, trying to locate people oh, yeah. uh, who uh, the community consider as specialist in uh, knowledge related to the hornbills. Mm. So she came uh, came with this uh, beautiful group of people, this uh, sample size, and uh, and then we started the interview, and then we figured out that the knowledge is not universally dispersed throughout the group, and there were three people who were exceptionally knowledgeable. Okay. And then uh, the more we interviewed them, the more we learned about hornbills. Okay. And uh, we figured out that uh, two of them were involved in subsistence hunting and uh, one had involved in agriculture during her okay. uh, younger years. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, that helped them inter uh, be in the field and interact with nature and uh, be part of on-field transmission of traditional ecological knowledge, uh, observe uh, the traditional, um, uh, observe the behavior of hornbills in mm. nature. So um, that helped them to develop knowledge on right. hornbills. Okay. And 
So um, that's interesting. Okay, so a few people who you know, say in the past they were hunting or in the forest and, and gained some of this knowledge. And so what is the type of um, knowledge that you found that they possessed? Uh, it's mostly ecological knowledge. Uh -huh. uh, of course, they could also speak about cultural knowledge, but that was mm -hmm. beyond the scope of the paper. Right. Um, ecological knowledge in the terms of they were able to clearly point out uh, the dietary behavior of hornbills, all mm. eight species of hornbills, what they eat, when they eat, what is the breeding season, that's mm. the reproductive behavior, what are the trees that they, where they prefer to build their nest, mm. and what are their mating behavior, which okay. is quite important, right. uh, the gestation period, uh. Uh, when they lay eggs. and. Right. Uh, the, more, the highlight of that is that uh, they, they clearly see the um, correspondence between uh, fruiting of certain tree species and nesting of birds, nesting of hornbills. Mm. And they were able to give, list down these tree species. Mm. And most of these tree species which they uh, listed down are tree species that are planted for local communities right. uh, in the backyard. Ah. Uh, which shows that ah. the behavior of local people in a way contributes towards sustaining the population of hornbills. That's really interesting, okay. Yeah. So it's not just, this isn't necessarily the case that all this ecological knowledge comes from being deep in the forest away from people. It's stuff that's happening around people as well that they're observing in, with the interaction between the hornbill and, and communities. That... Um, you're partly right. Okay, yeah. Uh -huh. Um, you can uh, we can divide the knowledge into two. Uh, I mean, the pattern knowledge right, pattern. Okay, yeah. to one is that uh, set of knowledge uh, retained by people who don't go to the jungle, ah. but their knowledge is limited to the hornbills that they can spot in their right. backyard. Okay. Yeah. Whereas um, the specialists are people who go deep into the jungle. I see. Okay. They are the ones who possess knowledge, uh, deep knowledge on all eight species. Okay. Whereas the other set of uh, uh, respondents, they had knowledge related to only three species. One is the Asian black hornbill, I oriental see. white hornbill, and then rhinoceros hornbill and, and some circumstances. Okay. Because these are the ones that are commonly formed in the backyard. I see, okay. So, um, you know, uh, I think you found some pretty fascinating, um, or you made some fascinating discoveries. And one that really surprised me is that um, your informants indicated to you that the number of hornbills in Brunei is actually on the rise. Is that right? That's right. Which is surprising. How can that be? Because we think in the world today, everything is declining. So how can this be happening? Uh, they give two reasons for the two major reasons. One is that uh, the increase in the number of fruit bearing trees in uh, Brunei. Okay. And at the same time, uh, corresponding decrease in the fruit bearing trees in the neighboring countries right, like okay. the, uh, Sarawak of Malaysia and Borneo, right. where there has been massive logging and that okay. has led to, the, uh, led to the reduction in uh, fruiting trees. And the hornbills then migrate towards uh, Brunei. Okay. That's one reason. Uh, the second major reason is the banning of shotguns. Ah. Um, Brunei has a successful track record in banning shotguns ah. uh, post rebellion, you know, right, the, right. Fa famous rebellion. Uh -huh. And Brunei has also successfully implemented it. And, I mean, banning something is right, quite easy, right, right, yeah. but to implement that uh, takes a bit right, of effort. Okay. Uh, so uh, Brunei has successfully implemented the ban. And uh, if you look into research studies, literature, then one of the principal drivers affecting uh, loss of species in the case of Borneo is shotguns. I see. So we have this debate about uh, should subsistence hunting be encouraged or not. Right. In the context of Borneo, communities have been doing hunting for a long time. But the nature of hunting has changed. Ah, okay. So it's not the same as before where they were hunting with blow guns right. and you know, uh, traps and all mm -hmm. those things. Now it's all shotguns. Mm. Okay. So the efficiency increases. Right. And this efficiency exceeds the capacity of the birds to replenish their population, I breed see. and replenish their population. Right. In the case of Bo uh, Brunei, because they eliminated shotguns wow. and uh, they are quite particular about enforcing it, uh, enforcing the um, a ban on hunting the protected species. Uh -huh. And all eight species of hornbills are protected. Ah, okay, I see. So what happens is that hornbills have survived. I see, okay, wow, and, that's uh, uh. Yeah, And should, uh, uh, sorry to add more, uh, subsistence hunting happens, but only to, uh, and it's limited to those species which are not under the protected list. I see, okay, so. wow, that's, that's fascinating.
Um, so, uh, yeah, so uh, you went to Temburong, you found these people who have traditional ecological knowledge, you tried to understand what they um, know about the, the hornbills, uh, but I still, I struggle sometimes to wonder, okay, what do we do beyond that? So we find out that, you know, there's this traditional knowledge, where do we go with that? Uh, there are three significant out significant outcomes on that uh, that line. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's an important question because uh, very often we get these questions, right, especially yeah. from youngsters, mm -hmm. who say that why do we need to consult traditional knowledge? Mm -hmm. I mean, we have been scientifically advanced, we have mm -hmm. developing, and there's no need need in looking back. I mean, we don't have to romanticize traditional knowledge. Like mm -hmm. all set of knowledge, it comes with its own pitfalls. But what our study demonstrates is that. Um, with a limited budget, with very little of money, it would be possible to generate a lot of information on the ecosystem mm, I see. by simply looking into the traditional ecological knowledge. I see. So hornbills, if you if you talk to ecologists who have dedicated their lives to studying hornbills, they are one of the most difficult group of birds to study. Mm. But by depending on people's traditional ecological knowledge, we are uh, taking a shortcut. I see. Okay. Because people have accumulated observatory observatory data over a long period of time, right, okay. and we are making use of this knowledge to understand hornbills. Mm. And we know that hornbills are important for the sustenance of forests. Mm -hmm. So, by working with the people, we are generating knowledge which can help us in conserving nature, mm -hmm. hornbills, which includes hornbills and forests on mm. one side, and the second, ecotourism. Mm. So uh, Brunei is quite particular on conserving its forests, mm. but at the same time we also have to generate money, mm -hmm. which could be then fed back into conserving uh, conservation efforts. Right. Okay. It's the same for any other country, mm. and ecotourism is one opportunity. So if you plan it properly, then ecotourism could bring back benefits to the local community. Mm. Now, now we know that where the hornbills can be found, what they what they depend on, etc. So this knowledge can be used by tour guides mm. who are trained by the local communities. Right, okay. and they can bring people in smaller number, mm -hmm. and you know they could pass on this information. Right, and that, that could bring revenues. Okay, yeah, that makes sense to me because in reading your article, there was one point where uh, you know one of your informants is talks about how I think at a certain place on a certain river at a certain time of the year, the hornbills come, and yeah, that's very valuable knowledge for either to to go and see them or to avoid that area, depending on you know what the situation might be. Yeah, it's, it's exactly. A, exactly. Yeah, right. uh, that's an important, valuable information for science also, mm. both for ecotourism as well as for, right. for science. Okay. For ecotourism, we need we can't take people at random toward the forest mm. because then right. um, you know people are here for a short time and they wouldn't be able to see anything. Right. I see. Whereas That's these true, people yeah. can specifically tell us where these birds can right. be found. Yeah. 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 So okay. Um, so I, I've kind of gone through your article in my lay you know way of asking questions about something I don't know about. From your perspective, um, what is it that you think you found that is of, of particular note? What, what, are, what got you the most excited, I guess? The most uh, exciting claim that we came across was the existence of um, uh, partner cheating. Oh. Uh -huh. So we have uh, one of the specialists saying that uh, uh, hornbills are known to be monogamous. Ah. You know, but the romantic notion of hornbills is that right. they always stick to the same partner to the end of their life. But according to this specialist, uh, he says that um, in hornbills, uh, uh, sometimes there could be partner cheating where, the, where a different male other than the partner could feed the nesting female. I see. You know, in hornbills, the female incarcerates herself. She gets into this nesting cavity and then she seals inside. Okay. Uh -huh. And it's a male who is responsible for bringing food for her. Um, but sometimes there could be a second partner involved who ah. uh, comes in and uh, feeds her. Mm -hmm. In those cases, the actual male partner develops or um, uh, notices that. Uh -huh. And then he stops feeding her. Oh wow! Yeah. Interesting. Uh, he apparently he keeps track of the appetite. Okay. The appetite of the female. Right. Okay. And when the appetite reduces, and he finds abnormal accumulation of uh, seeds and food. Uh, I see. Expectorated remains on the 
floor of the tree. Okay. Then he becomes suspicious, and then after a while, he would abandon the female, and the female would be dying inside the nest along with the chicks. Wow. And this is something that has not been uh, reported from hornbills. Okay. There has been researchers who have studied the uh, hornbills, but they couldn't come across this phenomenon. Okay. They have tried to find out if that is, this is true in the case of hornbills. It mm -hmm. has been reported from other birds like zebra fringe, mm -hmm. uh, but not in hornbills. Whereas our uh, respondents, uh, specialists especially, okay. they claim that it happens. So this is something that's a valuable information for uh, ecologists, you know, they could check into that. Right. Then that's a, that's a complementary knowledge to what we have already right. yeah. accumulated on hornbills. So the male hornbill is very observant and your informant was also very observant to notice uh, this happening out there. That's really fascinating. Yes, yeah. and um, it was not uh, one of knowledge. Okay. Uh -huh. And he had accumulated that knowledge from his grandfather ah. and he is involved in passing on it to, to his son. Okay. That's why we use the term traditional ecological knowledge. Right. So that brings us back to the first question that right. you asked. Uh -huh. So this knowledge, we didn't, did not use the term local knowledge because the knowledge is passed on from one generation to another. I it's see. still being actively passed on. Okay. And I guess th one of the hopes of your research is that this will draw attention to this and it will continue to be passed on. That's right. Yeah, okay. uh, we are quite optimistic about that because I was, uh, I, I had the privilege to accompany one of our um, participants mm -hmm. to the jungle and I had the privilege to observe how he was uh, training his uh, children. Ah, okay. And it's so meticulous. Ah, really? Interesting. There's so much okay. of planning, there's so much of involvement and there's so much of sacrifice. Okay. Because we know youngsters, uh, to motivate youngsters to go into the jungle, and do these kind of things, yeah. bird watching, yeah. uh, it takes a lot of effort. Okay. And we really have to appreciate the Iban people mm. for ensuring or um, uh, taking um, uh, taking special effort mm -hmm. to ensure that the um, uh, traditional knowledge is maintained and passed on. I think that's a very happy note to uh, conclude this conversation. Um, I wanna thank you for talking with me and this article when the seeds sprout, the hornbills hatch, understanding the traditional ecological knowledge of the Ibans of Brunei Darussalam. This is available online, uh, open access, is that it's, right? It's, it's free for access. Free for access, everybody. yeah, yep. okay. Right. Um, so we'll have a link here below so that people can access it, and thank you very much. Thanks for inviting, it was a pleasure being here. All right.